From the Bill of Rights Institute, Fabric of History weaves together U.S. history, founding principles, and what all of this means to us today. Join us as we pull back the curtains of the past to see what's inside. Is yesterday history? What about last week? At some point, the past eventually becomes history, but where exactly do we draw the line? Join Mary, Gary, Aaron, and special guest Matthew Hoosier, reporter on the White House and state and local governments at the Kiplinger Letter, as they discuss the complex relationship between history and journalism. What does good journalism mean, and how does a diligent approach to consuming and recording current events help future historians? Like many of us, Matthew was working from home during this recording. Just letting you know that Thor, his great Dane, created some background noise in an effort to participate. Hi, everybody. A question that comes up frequently here at BRI among members of our team and also from teachers in our network is this question of when do current events become history? And at first, I think this question seems very meta. When is history history? But it also has a lot of practical implications as well. I mean, how much space do you need from an event before you can analyze it? And if you're a witness to an event, as we all are to current events, does our experience make our analysis too difficult or it's just there's a lot to talk about there. So we figured if we're going to explore this boundary between current affairs and history, we need to bring in a journalist for this conversation. So I am delighted to introduce our guest, Matthew Hoosier, covers the White House and state and local governments for the Kiplinger Letter. And the Kiplinger Letter is a weekly newsletter that specializes in forecasting political and economic trends, and they have been doing so since 1920, so rather historic in and of itself. So Matthew, thank you so much for being with Gary, Aaron, and I today. Thank you. I'm really excited uh, to be here. So before we get into our question, I first want to ask a little bit about your, your history. What drew you to journalism in the first place? Um, Well, I always liked writing, and I have uh, from a very young age, and um, there was a period of time where I really wanted to be um, a fiction writer, and uh, when I discovered that I wasn't great at that, and also some of the career challenges involved with that, I ended up going into journalism, which uh, doesn't, uh, you know, pay great, but obviously it, it puts bread on the table, so... Well, that's an important consideration, right? <laughs> Historians too, right? You gotta have bread on the table. Um, oh, and then as far as uh, how I got to Kiplinger, um, so I, I switched my major in in college to to journalism, and then I co majored uh, in history. Then I, uh, after my junior year of college, I did an internship uh, at Kiplinger, and uh, was very lucky that they asked me to come back uh, uh, to my current position after I graduated from college. So, well, that's great. And again, we're we're glad that you're with us today. So if I can jump in, so you studied both history and journalism. So already it sounds like you 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 are seeing that uh, the connections between the two, possibly the interplay between the two. Um, right off the bat, I feel like we should just pose that question. Do you um, have a personal answer to when history begins and when current events end, or is that or is that too much for the beginning? <laughs> um, no, no. <laughs> I mean, I mean, if you want to go like get really philosophical about it, in some ways it begins almost like instantaneously because you just um, immediately after, especially in the journalism world, immediately after you stop covering something as a current event or something that happened, you start thinking about it in retrospect and thinking about how it fits in um, with a lot of other past events. And so, so, so in some ways, if, if depending on on your approach, I think you could say it begins almost immediately, although. Most folks, um, before they're going to reflect on 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 a current event as history, want to gain a little bit of distance and, and perspective. Um, so, j- just as an example, I'm I'm working uh, on a book chapter um, about uh, uh, the Big Sioux River and and um, the politics of it um, for a, a uh, an academic institution back in my home state of South Dakota. Uh, the Big Sioux River is a major river there. And I go all the way from the beginning of South Dakota statehood all the way to the 2020 election, which obviously um, is is quite recent or quite near to where we are now. 
but um but it, it's there's been a few months so i've been able to maybe get a little more perspective on it that that helps in my writing about it in that respect so i'm curious then um when if you're writing this chapter in a book and you're saying that months give you that perspective would you say that a few months can pass and that's something that we would be consider history or because i mean we'll dive into this conversation more but i think there are just so many nuanced responses some say that it's an entire lifetime or generation that has to pass and other people are like we're living history so where do you think that kind of quote-unquote timeline lies i guess i would subscribe more to if i if i understand um, living history in the same way you do. I think I would subscribe more to that essentially in, um, uh, you know, there are things that are happening to us, um, now or things that were like as a journalist that I'm covering. Um, but the minute that I start to consider it in the broader context of history and that way it kind of becomes history because it comes, becomes kind of part of this timeline, um, and, and, um, a chain of events that you're thinking about, um, so, so, so yeah, I, I, I think that, um, some, some of it depends on how you are considering the event. Can I follow up about that, that context and history and, and, and talking about like living through things because you're right. I mean, we, we, we are experiencing things every day. Are there observational skills that we can perhaps cultivate to become, uh, perhaps better observers of history as it's unfolding? Huh. That's that's a good question. Um, uh, it's sort of tough for me to say. I guess for me is being able to draw analogies, and I guess maybe just like uh, the more like for the more history you read, the maybe the more tempted you are to to draw comparisons between the present and the past. And I think that sort of starts that process of of uh, current events becoming history, and and you start thinking when yeah. I think as I said before, when you start thinking in, in that broader context. Um, so 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 definitely. Um, the ability, I guess, to draw analogies, I think is, is a really, is a really big one. I like that idea of, um, of making analogies. I know a lot of our listeners are teachers, but even, even if you aren't a teacher of history, um, just having certain skills in your toolbox is so critical when you're thinking about the past and also just sort of as a citizen of the United States to be like a critical consumer of information. So I know that there are, I know for me personally, I was never a professional journalist, but I did school newspapers ever since I was little and, and through college. And there's always, I always personally kind of see a lot of parallels of, you know, who is it? What happened? Um, when did this happen? So sort of the basic facts, but there's also the interpretive and the analytical piece of it as well. So maybe we can take a quick break and sort of dive into this idea of the the skills and sort of these habits of mind that are needed to do to do quote unquote history and to do to do journalism. Hey, Fabric of History listener, learned anything new yet? At BRI, we have a lot more to share. Check out our YouTube channel in the description where we dissect and discuss U.S. history and civics with experts and teachers. We update weekly and would love for you to join the conversation. And now... Back to our podcast. We started our conversation with this big question, you know, when is history history? And we were exploring this idea that there are skills you need to do journalism well, and there's also skills you need to think about history well. And, you know, educators, we like our our jargon, we're usually referred to as historical thinking skills. They're really just thinking skills, like analyzing evidence is, is a historical thinking skill or thinking about patterns of continuity of change. So you definitely need to do these things, I think, when you are looking at history. But you also need to do these things when you're looking at the world around you here in the now, <laughs> as they say. So um, I think that's I mean, that's kind of the goal, right? If you're thinking about education or especially history education to create, you know, citizens that are capable of self-governance, which is what, you know, BRI is all about, then you have to have that skill set both for the past and to, 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 to consider the world around you. So I wanted to sort of move the conversation into, um, we started with this idea of distance, Right. And is there is there a hard and fast 
amount of time that needs to, you know, break up an event before we can really analyze it. But are there are there benefits to being a part of history, of living through history? Are, are there certainly there? I mean, for anything, there's pros and cons, but maybe we could consider um, thinking about the pros and cons of distance from an event versus the pros and cons of living through an event, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think the, the main pro of, of the distance is, uh, I guess it gives you more of a, uh, a bird's eye view of what's happening to a certain degree and allows you to put aside certain biases or um, prejudices you might have had if you were living through a, a period of history and and hopefully um, you know have have better perspective and be able to to balance or be able to uh, to be able to to more clearly see the facts as opposed to being blinded by um, by, by, by your biases. Um, um, by contrast, though, I mean, the, the con with, with the distance, and it's also a pro of being able to live through history, is uh, you, you understand better um, what, what the main actors, um, what, what would be driving them, um, how they were feeling at the time. Um, and ideally, it's possible to have some distance as an observer of the present as well and be able to um, to put aside some of your biases. And I think a lot of the, the best journalists really are very good at doing that. So I, I think it's very interesting to hear how, to, how a journalist does that. Maybe other people would argue differently. But I feel like people are very emotionally invested in things that are happening, whereas I think a lot of people argue that and, um, you know, history suggests that we should be almost dispassionate about it or you know, not um, not have that emotional connection. And so I would love to hear more about like work that you've done with recent events that you may even be personally passion impassioned about. But like with your job as a journalist, have to remove that. Sure. Yeah. So. I, I do a lot of elections coverage uh, as part of my job, uh, and I've been at Kiplinger since 2016. So um, I've covered two presidential elections, uh, the first obviously being the 2016 presidential election, which caught a lot of um, caught a lot of people off guard in Washington, including uh, Kiplinger. We've been forecasting presidential elections since, uh, I believe, 1924, and we've only gotten two wrong. Uh, 1948, which was the infamous uh, Dewey defeats Truman. I know that image, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, everyone everyone knows the the image of Truman uh, Truman smiling with that newspaper headline. Um, and then 2016, obviously. Uh, and um, I I think maybe I'm very proud to say that we ended up doing a lot better in our 2020 election prediction, and. I, I would like to say part of that is that we did a lot more on the ground reporting, um, you know, uh, whereas maybe in 2016, I would say I took a very, very much in some ways because on Kiplinger forecast, you almost think about it historically more readily because you're thinking of, oh, what will future generations think of what my predictions were at this moment? And um, how will they look back at, at this forecast and, and how will it fit historically? Um, and uh, in some ways, I, I took more of a historical, I mean, a historian's mindset and I kept more of a distance, um, you know, in terms of just more engaging with poll numbers um, and uh, and trying to trying to be as dispassionate as possible. Uh, and, and maybe almost stay away from the passions that were fueling um, voters uh, during that election. And that proved not to be a very good approach in the end, obviously, because we ended up getting that election wrong. Whereas in 2020, um, you know, despite the pandemic, we were able, uh, me and my um, and uh, my colleague, Sean Lingell, were able to do a lot more on the ground reporting, talking to people Um and really getting a better sense of, of how voters were feeling on top of maybe the more hard 
facts about you know you know who's up in the polls, who is ahead in fundraising data, um, things of that sort. Um, so in some ways, it's, it's roughly analogous, I guess, to um, you know the when you're doing history and you only have access to um, you know certain like statistics and, and and things like that that give you kind of a rough sense or, or a very uh, a distant sense of what was happening at the time, you know, like demographic data, census data, things like that versus having or, or voting election results, past election results, which I've spent a lot of time with recently uh, versus being able to also have really good primary sources that really give you like diaries or things like that, that give you a, a good sense of, of what folks were feeling at the time. In addition to that hard data that you have that kind of gives you the framework for thinking about um, an event. So that brings a couple things to mind for me. So I love um, well, one thing that that came to mind as you were talking is that there's this there's this balance between being subjective and objective. Like you said, with the 2016 election, it was more dispassioned and you were looking at the polls and that pro- ended up not being successful in your in the forecast. But for 2020, you did you were still looking at the data, but you were also on the ground talking to people. Um, so I think like if I had my teacher hat on, there is this balance between you have to be objective, like you have to be able to talk about, you know, events and the facts, but you also, you have to have that human element. You have to like make history come alive, like all these silly things that, you know, they, they sell off to teachers. But if you don't have that personal connection in some way, you often lose students or they're not interested. So it's interesting to hear you say that you had that balance when you said you did a much better job in 2020. The second thing I was wondering, can you can you elaborate a little bit on what you said when you said you were on the ground in 2020? What did that mean for you and your colleague in your reporting? Were you traveling around or? Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, the main thing, we, we actually went and um, went and spent a decent amount of time in states that we thought were going to be pivotal to deciding the election. Uh, so I spent time, for example, in North Carolina, Minnesota, uh, Wisconsin. My colleague Sean uh, spent even more time uh, traveling on the road uh, to places like uh, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Florida. Yeah. And, and the goal was to basically just talk to as many people as possible and really get a better sense of of um of just how voters were feeling and and i i think i th- this may be obvious an obvious point to make i guess but uh, uh people's political opinions are a lot more diverse than is ever reflected by polling data or or in, in the in election results um just because you know we have two major parties that people are voting for um, but when you get right down to it and you talk to uh, folks who might be voting Democratic, they might have a lot of views that would surprise you and ditto people who are voting Republican. Uh, and so all those things are are really important to to um, take into account and ha- uh, help inform inform the predictions that you're trying to make um, about a political outcome. And, and about with people in history and the human element, people make history. And so in some ways, it's a, sort of a folly to try to boil it down to um, – you know, a series of facts and statistics and stuff. Matt, did you ever find it difficult to be kind of reporting or gathering information? And, and if you're talking with people who I'm sure had a variety of different opinions and thoughts, did you ever find that difficult? Or do you just feel like you're so strongly trained and kind of like what you're doing that you were able to listen to them um, objectively instead of? subjectively um that's a good question um i i i think i mean i everybody has biases and i think in some ways it's it's almost impossible to totally remove those um um from the way you perceive the world but uh in in terms of i I felt because i was so focused especially in 2020 about making sure i got the outcome right i i think that became the uh, the overarching goal uh, in my mind, and I think it made it a lot easier to really step out, step away from any sort of political opinions or whatever that I had, and just see people's opinions for what they were. Side note: I'm just going to try and like frame that type of idea in my mind in any 
impassioned conversation that I have now. Like, <laughs> I'm going to take a historical mindset from now on, guys. Like, that's my goal. But actually, I love, that. I, I love that phrase, historical mindset, because I think that speaks to what we were talking about earlier, which is getting in, being aware of the future, right? So so there's what's happening. <laughs> there's there's the distant past. And, and you mentioned earlier, Matt, you know, when, when telling a story, you may have to go pretty far back to put it into context. Um, you know, an election is a good example. That's, that's, that's not out of the blue that an election happened. They happened every four years, there's a nice kind of continuity that happens there. Um, but then to what Aaron's point, you know, is is this idea of getting into the mindset to know that future generations will be looking back on whatever we're, we're recording. Um, you know, there's a phrase that, that gets kicked around, the idea of, of, of journalism and, and whatnot being the first draft of history, right? This, <laughs> um, that, that it's, that, that there's an awareness that you are recording things that will be part of the historical record going forward. Um, can you tell us more about that mindset? Um, I know that's a big question to ask, but um, any sort of insights into into getting into that headspace that one is creating what we're calling a first draft of history? Just, just as in the way you, you need to um, read a lot in order to be a good writer, I think you need to know your history really well to think in a historical way way and i guess that's maybe one reason why um you know really really good reporters ultimately end up being experts in the subjects that they cover um because because they're not just um they're not just regurgitating uh cert certain facts that they're given they're also you know doing their research putting everything in context and and so yeah mostly mostly it's just about um casting um you know, your net far and wide to get as much knowledge as you can about whatever subject that you're covering. And then um, that will in turn put you on uh, uh, better footing to, in order to, to analyze the subject and, and have that historical mindset or, or have that um, have that objectivity and distance that you need. I think that makes a lot of sense. And it makes me appreciate <laughs> how difficult um, good reporting and how your job, how difficult that that is. But I think something that you know, as you're talking, something I'm thinking about is this idea, this idea of seeking truth. Like I think Kiplinger, like you forecast. So like you said, you make a call, Kiplinger makes a call that this person is going to win the election. So it's, um, it's a little bit different than I think a, like reading, I don't know, the Washington Post or the New York Times or something like that. Um, but it's, but you want the truth. You want to be correct. You want to get the outcome correct. And I think I think historian kind of historians are similar in that we're trying to understand what happened. So we are pursuing truth in some way. I think also what I would add is that over time in history, more as more information is released or known, our understanding of that event tends to change, right? And so I think like this idea of truth is ever evolving. Yeah, that's a that's a really good point and I think works against what I had said earlier about in some ways history begins, you know, almost instantaneously after an event occurs. Uh but to a certain degree history does begin instantaneously, but it it must uh you, you need to wait for more information and and to come out and more distance to uh, to be eclipsed before you can, before it becomes good history, I guess, maybe uh, keeps getting molded and shaped and, and eventually becomes better. So maybe it's like a sculptor working with a, with a block of marble. First of all, great analogy. Um, <laughs> but um, it's funny that really, that really brings up in my mind, a historical event that I wonder if I could see if I can match what you're saying with this event. As you were describing that, Matt, I was thinking about uh, the, Challenger disaster. Uh, I think it's on my mind because it's uh, within some of BRI's materials. We've been we've been talking about that with teachers lately, but that is something I, I do have recollection of living through. I may be the only one on here that does. Okay, <laughs> no, I remember um, it. And as you're saying, <laughs> there that was an interesting case of watching history lay out. There was something planned, right? It was not the first space mission. Something unexpected, which was terrible. On that day, there was a lot of people watching. 
on that day, it was unclear what happened until little by little later on, you got the story weeks, months later, it came into focus. Then as years passed, much more of what happened came into focus. And now it is part of history in a, in a really important way because there's so many interpretations of what occurred, not interpretations challenging what happened, what happened certainly happened, but understand that the technology of it, understanding the communications of it, understanding President Reagan's uh, speech and its position in history now and, and the role. And there's lots of ways of looking at that. That, to me, is an interesting um, sort of uh, example of, I think, what you're talking about there. Yeah, that's that's a great point. And it's sort of maybe the what what you described is a good example of how you have the who, what, where, when, the very, very basics, the DNA of history, and then how you build off of that over time um, as more information comes out and as um, you explore more perspectives of a particular event. I love that phrase that you use, the DNA of history. I think that is, that's such a fabulous phrase. I would totally use that if I were still in the classroom. But I think the Challenger disaster is such a, such a great example of how you needed that the journalism of the time of what happened, the nuts and bolts, the DNA of history in order to, as time passed and more was known and more was released, study that event and its consequences in, with a historical mind. I have to say that throughout much of this conversation, I have thought about, um, as a former history teacher, how we used to joke about how there's always more history to teach, right? Because you're, you're living, we're, we're marching through time and all these, you know, more and more things keep happening. And I you know if we go back to our, the beginning of our conversation, we were just this idea of, do you need to have that space? What is the, the magic amount of time between an event and it being considered history? Or is it some sort of balance? And, and I would argue that it's definitely the balance. Like, if you've lived through it, you're close to the event, you may be emotionally invested in the event, but we're human and that's part of interpreting events. And perhaps with more time and more distance, we'll be more objective, more information will be known. But I don't think the conversation shouldn't happen. So I'm showing my colors here of, you know, advocating for trying to talk about events as they happen, because that's I don't know, I would say, isn't that the point of history? We can have a historical mind to think about the past and to think about the future. And you'll only understand something the more you investigate it. So just keep asking questions, right? That's what we're all about here. We're asking questions, we're trying to find answers, and our work is never done. So Matthew, thank you so much for joining us today. We really enjoyed having you here on as part of our conversation. And again, the Kiplinger letter, we'll put a link to the Kiplinger website in our show notes. Be sure to check them out. And we'd love to hear from you, Fabric of History listeners. If you learn something, if you have a comment, a question on anything we talked about today, you can write to us at comments at fabricofhistory.com. Please subscribe, give us a review. We'd love to hear from you. And until we meet again, keep asking those questions. Take care, everybody. The Bill of Rights Institute engages, educates, and empowers individuals with a passion for the freedom and opportunity that exists in a free society. Check out our educational resources and programs on our website, mybri.org. Any questions or suggestions for future episodes? We'd love to hear from you. Just email us at comments at fabricofhistory.org. And don't forget to visit us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram to stay connected and informed about future episodes. Thank you for listening. 